1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 is where we'll take our text from. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not, Everybody say, was not. not. With enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration. Everybody say demonstration. Demonstration. Of the spirit and of power. That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. I'm going to preach to you for a few minutes tonight on the one word titled message, Demonstration. 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 In the name of the Lord Jesus. Dear God in heaven, I love you tonight. I felt you pulling at us tonight, Lord. I felt you drawing us. I felt you desiring to do a great work among us. And we all know that that's always to fill somebody with the Holy Ghost. See somebody's life change forever. I pray, God, that you will anoint us to deliver this anointed word. Lord, anoint my words. Anoint my lips. Anoint my thoughts, oh God. And and anoint our ears to hear and understand and receive the word of God. And let it be alive in our lives as we go about our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Demonstration. Demonstration. Hallelujah. The reason we are required to study the Word is in order to be a workman that needs not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the Word of truth. But when it's all can be summed up in this one phrase, Brother David, is in order to be approved by God. We've got to study the Word with approval of God Almighty being the goal as we apply it to our lives and we grow in understanding. There are many, and I have encountered them lately. Brother McKinney and I encountered a fellow a few weeks ago. There are many that study the Word with the express purpose to prove themselves right and to prove others wrong. They focus on a particular thing. Many cases manipulating the word to serve their own purpose. And lambast folks with totally inconsequential information. So much stuff coming at you about something that that doesn't even matter in the grand scheme of things. And in many times is simply a personal preference uh, until you become flustered and frustrated. In light of this knowledge and in light of this experience, uh, 2 Corinthians 11 says, uh, Paul to the Corinthians, in church. Uh, would to God that you would bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me for I am jealous over you with godly jealousy for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. And then he says then he says but I'm afraid I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so show your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ for he that cometh for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus everybody say another Jesus whom we have not preached or if you receive another spirit which you have not received or another gospel which you have not accepted you might well bear with him I want to bring the first standpoint to you from verse 3. The simplicity of the gospel has got to be enough. Part of the power of the gospel is its simplicity. As it is clearly defined, we can't get away from it. And I told you this morning I'm going to preach it till Jesus comes. It is the likeness of His death, His burial, and His resurrection. I wish some folks around here tonight would begin to act like that we have been resurrected from a life of death according to sin and the lust of the flesh to the hope of eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Preaching another Jesus is seemingly foolish on the surface. But if he is not, oh God help me right now. But if he is not preached as he is, if he's dressed up any other way, if he's manipulated any other way, if he's given other emphasis than the simplicity of the gospel, then it's somebody else they're preaching about. 
There's only one Jesus. He's one God who robed himself in the likeness of sinful flesh. He lived, he died, he was buried, and he rose again. That's all we got to know. That's the truth of the matter, and it's the simplicity of the gospel. Admittance into this church. The church of the living God is contingent upon the revelation of who Jesus is. Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Jesus asked Peter and the disciples. They told him, "Thou." some say thou art Elias or Jeremiah or John the Baptist or one of the prophets. But the key question when he said, whom do you say that I am? And Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. <laughs> Hear me right now as I try to preach to you this simple thought on demonstration. The beautiful thing about it, Brother David, is that Jesus told him, blessed art thou, Simon Bar." Jonah for flesh and blood is not what revealed it to you but my father which is in heaven I'm happy to let you know I just felt like a, an epiphany I felt like a light bulb went off when I realized the difference in people being argumentative and the difference in people having this belief and that belief and another belief is that what I've got ain't cooked up it ain't sung up it ain't bought up but it came from heaven it came from the throne room of God Almighty it's the power of God God! You think about the power, the impact of that. When we feel the presence of the Lord, you feel it in pre-service prayer. When nobody's singing and nothing's going on or people are milling around or you're driving down the road and you feel the Holy Ghost or you're laying in your bed and you feel the Holy Ghost. Or you didn't cook it up, you didn't work it up, but it came out of heaven. Yeah. We need to be rooted and grounded in the gospel to have faith in the power of the cross and we've got to preach it, believe it and live it until Jesus comes Paul very clearly states how he did not come brother Bobby he said I didn't come with enticing words of man's wisdom but I came simply declaring the testimony of God Almighty if it's flowery words you're looking for if it's great founts of wisdom that you're searching for you're going to be disappointed in most cases our preaching and speech must be ungirded as Paul's was. They must be undergirded as Paul's was. Our preaching and our speech and our singing and our Sunday school lessons and each and everything we do have got to be undergirded just the same as Paul's ministry was in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Amen. You hear me well right now. If you're just talking, if you're just getting up and talking, trying to come up with something cool to say, trying to come up with something that ain't ever been done before, you're going to fail miserably. But we have got to have everything we say or do accompanied by demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The only thing that makes us different from everybody else is a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Listen to me right now. In, in 1 Kings, the 18th chapter, there's an instance when the 400 prophets that sat at Jezebel's table or the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of the grove came to stand against the prophet of God whose name was Elijah. And Elijah stood up. You hear me well right now, church of the living God. Elijah stood up to the people and he declared very profoundly, how long halt ye between two opinions? I don't want to be ugly, but there's not a thousand different ways. There's only two ways. The right way and the wrong way. There's not a bunch of different ways, but there's just one one way that's truth and one way that's wrong. How long halt ye between two opinions? Will the Lord be God or will Baal be God? And the Bible said they answered him not a word. When they had the opportunity to step over to the side of the right, they chose to keep their mouth shut. So you, you may well know the story how Elijah said, get me two bullocks. And you take one, you lay it on the altar and you dress it. And you pray to your God. 
And then I'm going to take one and I'm going to dress it and put it on an altar and I'm going to pray to my God. And, oh, God, help me right now. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. And the people said, so be it as you say. The story goes on that they take the bullock, uh, the prophets of Baal take the bullock that they're given and they lay it on the altar. And from early in the morning, which is generally considered 6 a.m., Brother Rice, uh, they begin to pray and they begin to wail and they begin to dance. Uh, and they begin to chant uh, and they begin to do all the things that they would do brother David and nothing happened and then they got a little desperate after the noontime hour because they begin to cut themselves and, and it's, it's no small thing you think about this Sister Maria, the Bible said, I never noticed it really till today. The Bible said that they climbed up on that altar of Baal. And they cut themselves. Brother Robbie, there was a type and shadow of them trying to mix their own blood with that of the sacrifice. They were increasing the, the importance and increasing their fervor and increasing their commitment. They, they were doing that it, 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 as, as homage to their God, as showing their God how serious they were, how sincere they were. Please understand that they were not doing that just to try to prove a point to Elijah. Brother Robbie, they truly believed they were right. Then to the time of the evening sacrifice, they continued wailing, cutting themselves, blood running on the altar, and nothing happened. Elijah even, I, I'm not espousing this or suggesting that we do it. Matter of fact, I strongly suggest we don't. But Elijah even began to poke a little fun at him, saying perhaps he's busy elsewhere. Or maybe he's asleep. Maybe he don't have time for you right now. But as, as, you, as you well know, nothing happened. They were completely exhausted. They had nothing left. And there sat the bullock all day long praying to a God that wasn't listening. Because you see, the things that they gave credit to their God for really belonged to the true God. The praise belonged to the true God. But yet they had dressed him up, changed him to something different. Called him by a different name. The name Baal is in fact a generic name for God. There's strong evidence that at one point in time even the true God was known as Baal in the minds of people. But Elijah finally took his bullock and he laid it on top of the altar. And he said, and I don't fully understand how they even acquiesced to this because they were in the middle of a drought, in the middle of a famine. But he said, get several bottles of water, barrels of water, and pour it on my sacrifice. Dig a ditch around it and fill it full of water. And the Bible says when they were done, all of this happened after Elijah rebuilt the altar that Jezebel's prophets had torn down. That Elijah said, O oh God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, let it be known this day that you are God. Let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at your word. And the Bible says, hear me, that this people may know that thou art the Lord God. Give me the next verse. Then the fire. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know any other way to slice it, dice it, tell it, or yell it. But the difference is in the one that has the demonstration. I'm not talking about blowing on somebody and they fall out or touching somebody behind their ear, but I'm talking about something that comes from heaven, Brother David, something that comes from the very throne room of God. And when it touches you, there's no doubt in your mind that it's a God thing. Our faith cannot stand in the wisdom of man. It cannot stand in tradition. It cannot stand in following the example of somebody that we put stock in. It must only stand in the power of God. Yes. But you hear me well right now, Pentecostals. In order for that to be the case, 
It cannot be just the power that we read about in Scripture. Our only testimony of the power cannot just be that conveyed by a missionary on some foreign field. The demonstration of the Spirit and the power of God must be in front of us and active among us. I said the demonstration of the Spirit and of power needs to be active among us, in front of us, around us, and in our community. Mark 16, 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Preach the gospel, the same gospel, the only gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not won't be baptized and shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Ladies and gentlemen, we have been told by the scripture that these signs shall follow them that believe. I just wonder if there's some believers in the house at 1031 Mill Street in New Madrid, Missouri, if there's some people that believe that this power that we talk about... Listen to me, it can't be something that we cook up. It can't be something that we work up. It can't be just emotions because emotions are going to run out in the evening time. It can't be you afflicting yourself for nothing. There's got to be power. There's got to be something real. And it ain't coming from us. It came from heaven. God forbid that we fail to recognize the power of the Holy Ghost among us. We need a demonstration of the Spirit and of power. The Bible says, In my name shall they cast out devils. We need a demonstration of power over the enemy of our soul. Power over the accuser of the brethren. Power over the father of all lies. We need to demonstrate the, the power that we have uh, over the enemy and the accuser of the brethren. As the Bible said, these signs shall follow them that believe. We need to demonstrate power over the clutches of sin and the old man. Power as demonstrated when we fulfilled with the Holy Ghost and we begin to speak in a language that we didn't know up until that moment. And we won't know it when we get done. All we know that the spout out of heaven that pours out the Holy Ghost has filled me up to overflowing. And I begin to speak with other tongues. We need power. Over the. Now, let me tell you right now. Let me tell you right now. I felt the Holy Ghost direct me this afternoon. So, if there's any wrong in what I'm about to tell you, it's all mine. But I felt led by the Spirit. The Bible says they shall speak with new tongues. And give me the next verse. They shall take up serpents. Now let me tell you something. That is not scripture for us to go snake handling. Amen. Listen to me, it's not. But I want you to, feel, Brother David, I felt the Holy Ghost direct me, and I mean fast. They lived in a very primitive culture. How many, we've even read Louis Lamar books. And what's the first thing that the cowboy did when he woke up in the morning? Shook his boots out. Because critters was everywhere. In the Bible days, Brother Robbie, they were more primitive than that. There were snakes and there were scorpions and there were critters everywhere. They constantly were going to the wood pile. They constantly had to go out to the river to beat their, beat their, wash their clothes out. Uh, it was a very primitive culture. And these serpents that this is talking about, the deadly serpents. Uh, I, I, I don't know how to let you know this, uh, but there has never been a time when a, a snake rolled up into your yard, raised his head up, and said, just want to let you know I'm here. All right. But, 
Oh, God have mercy. When you least expect it. I believe, as I'm led by the Holy Ghost, that when it's talking about taking up serpents, it's talking about the hidden things. The sneaky things that are coming after you. The things that are going to happen when you least expect it. The, the deadly things uh, that are going to try to steal your victory. Going to try to steal your joy. Going to try to destroy the faith of a believer. Yes. The things that when you are unaware are going to come at you. Just like the, the, the serpent itself will do. You go to pick up a board and there'll be a snake waller out from underneath it. Or you begin to crawl under a house like happened to me and one of them will run across your hand as you get underneath there. It's coming. Brother Rice, there are things that the Holy Ghost is going to protect us. The signs that, that, that follow the believer, Brother Pete, are going to be that the things that, oh God, the things that will tear down a normal person aren't going to affect us. The things that are going to catch a normal person off guard are are not going to affect us. It's these signs that follow them that believe that your neighbors are going to look and say, look what they're going through. Look what they're battling with. And nothing seems to shake them. Nothing seems to knock their faith. We don't live in a society where they're everywhere. They, we go to the grocery store. We don't have to go hunt for our food and, and go out in the garden for provide everything we have. It was the day they live in. But we're among people that entertain all kinds of spirits. That do all kinds of things. And you never know where the next battle's coming from. But these signs shall follow them that believe. A demonstration of the spirit. And of power. The next thing says. They shall. If they drink any deadly thing. Can I tell you that one of the signs of a believer is that we have power over the harmful things that may have been put into our body? We have power over the things that, that in that particular time, brother, brother Robbie, it was well known you don't drink the water just anywhere. You don't just go anywhere and dip a cup down in the stream because there was bacteria and there was, there was different uh, diseases and different infestations in the water. And I want to let you know, there's so many things that we put into our body and, and so many things that we afflict our body with. Uh, and I believe that the Bible is telling us very strongly that the things that, that we put into our body out of ignorance... Understand this. I'm not saying you can go on down and do just whatever you want to all willy-nilly. Drink anything, eat anything, stuff anything into your body. But I'm talking about the things that we do, the life that we live. Who knows? And I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but who, we don't have any clue in the world who handles our food. That's why some of you look at me like I'm ignorant sometimes. When I ain't worried about getting the flu in the church house. I ain't worried about catching Ebola in the church house. Amen. I ain't worried about getting the chicken pox or the measles in the church house. Right. Number one, I believe the Lord's going to protect me. Number two, Brother Robbie, I believe if I do, it ain't going to get me. That's right. Oh, y'all, I think I lost you. I'm talking about demonstration, Brother David. We got to demonstrate our faith in everything we do, in everywhere we go, in everywhere we live. And they shall lay hands on the sick. And they shall lay hands on the sick. Amen. And they shall recover. You hear me now and I'm rapidly coming to a close. It was the way Jesus operated. It was the way Paul operated. And it must be the way we operate. Under the influence and the direction of the supernatural. How long has it been since you had enough nerve to get out of your pew and take you a lap because the Holy Ghost was nudging you? How long has it been since you laid hands on somebody that was sick and prayed the prayer of faith for their healing because the Holy Ghost was nudging you? How long has it been since you went over to a loved one's house with the express, uh, the express direction to tell them about Jesus because the Holy Ghost nudged you? We've got to have demonstration of the Spirit. Who knows that there's somebody sitting on their couch right now waiting on you to come knock on their door. Who knows that somebody going to the grocery store right now waiting to bump into you. Ladies and gentlemen, i got to let you know 
I was set. Maggie O'Brien's, a restaurant on Market Street in St. Louis. You ever ate there? It's right down by Union Station. It's a nice little beer joint. But I met a man. I don't care for his name to get out there. His first name's Lynn. His second name will come to me in just a few minutes. He pastors in Dubuque, Iowa. I'm going to tell you this. These signs shall follow them that believe. Brother Robbie, it's his habit when he's eating out in a restaurant. That when the waiter delivers the food to the table, he says, this is a great thing. I want to start doing it. Especially when I eat somewhere where they, we can understand one another. He says, hey, and they're usually got a name tag. He did it to the waiter where I was. He said, hey, we're about to bless our food. We're about to pray over our food. Is there anything in your life you'd like for us to pray about? Well, as a matter of fact, there is. And he held hands with that waiter and he prayed the prayer of faith, prayed for our food. And prayed with that waiter. Just eat that easy. These, oh God help me right now. These signs shall follow them that believe. Do you know, Brother Pete, that waiter came back and came back and came back. Went and told his other guy over in the kitchen. And here's the funny thing. Brother Lynn Spicer is his last name. Great guy. He prayed with him and he kept coming back and thanking him. He said, I, I'm going to go to church and, and you've helped me here and you've helped me here and you've helped me here. But we were about to leave. Listen to me. And I'm going to close with this. These signs shall follow. You don't know what you got. We don't realize the power that's within us. Amen. Great big old husky black fella came out there. He was the cook getting ready to leave. Big old fella. Big, bigger than me. Especially better distributed than me. And he came and leaned over the, the railing there, started talking to us. We talked a few minutes. And he said, listen to me. Brother Spicer started to do him the same way. He said, you don't remember me, do you? Brother Spicer said, no, I don't. He said, you came in here last year at General Conference and you prayed with me. He said, I want you to know that I got me a wife. I'm going to church. I got my life together. And I ain't never forgot you coming in here praying with me. You say, well, I thought demonstration was making the blind eyes open or, or the lame to walk. The truth of the matter is... How many blind folks do you run into on a daily basis? Huh? Then there's an opportunity to let. The truth of the matter is, we don't see near the people afflicted as Jesus did. Not with physical afflictions. But how many drug addicts are waiting on you? How many people living in, in abusive relationships are waiting on you? Just, just a sign to follow the believer. What would be wrong with us, us becoming a church just like that? I, I'm, also, I'm, over, I'm fixing to bless my food. Uh, Fred, do you have anything we could pray about with you? Because these signs shall follow them that believe. He was still doing what he did a year ago. And there was signs behind him that come to meet him. All because he's a true believer. These signs shall follow them that believe. Brother Robbie, I believe the Bible is true. I believe every word from Genesis to Revelation is true. 
I'm ready to make a difference in my world. Are you ready to make a difference in your world? Stand with me.